uh, which is rather wonderful because it means that we can be in contact with him. We were certainly in contact with him last year um, and uh, he, via Teams, uh, this year he might come and see us personally, I suppose, but via Teams, he was able to uh, uh, engage with students doing the poems and express his view about what the poems were about. So very exciting uh, to be teaching the work of a living poet. Um, uh, we don't do that perhaps enough. Um, so we're going to be looking at those poems. They're, they're a cycle. They, they create a narrative from different points of view. Very interesting. Um, and your task would be simply to write about one, a uh, thousand words, on one of the poems. Um, and the only proviso is that you are referring to a couple of others. You know, you're showing that you can understand this poem in relationship to its form and language. That's really important. Uh, but you're also showing that you understand the interconnections that exist uh, between this poem and others. Um, if you refer to, if you were to refer to, say, three or four others, you'd have you'd have you'd have met the uh, the remit uh, of the exercise. All right, you're showing knowledge of the collection. Not a big book. I mean, it's about I think 60 pages long. Um, and we don't need to study all the poems because we want to get that done quite quickly because the next thing we need to do um, uh, in really right round about week three of the course is uh, we want to start looking at The Homecoming by Harold Pinter, which is one of the great plays of the 20th century uh, by one of the most important playwrights of the 20th century. Uh, and I'm pairing that with a novel that not many people would consider great literature. Uh, though I think it's a very, very interesting um, uh, novel myself. Uh, it's a novel called Jack's Return Home by Ted Lewis. You can see why I've chosen it. You know, there's a connection in the titles, isn't there? Jack's Return Home, The Homecoming. You'll find by the end of the exercise that there are an awful lot of connections between these two texts. One was first performed in 1965. The other was uh, published in 1970 and made very quickly into a film. Uh, rather a famous film. In fact, the film is much more famous than the novel. Uh, it stars Michael Caine and it goes under the title of Get Carter. And if you're wanting to do some preparatory reading, um, you'll get it under that title. If you go on Amazon, you won't find Jack's Return Home. It's now known by the title of the film. There's lots of interesting connections, um, you know, brotherly relationships, for example, uh, the concept of revenge, uh, looms large. Attitudes to women, very interesting in both texts. And rest assured that you would know in advance of me teaching you uh, these texts what the questions were. Uh, in fact, anyone who wants to take this any further should contact me. I'll give you my email address. It's richard.martin at mpw.ac.uk. And you can obviously get that information from uh, Jason or Steve as well. Um, but uh, the great thing is that you, oh, I'm, I'm just about to admit another student to the meeting. Hello, Nassim. Is that Nassim? Can you hear me, Nassim? Uh, oh, I think she's gone. Anyway, uh, to carry on with what I was saying, um, we're going to be writing 2,000 word essays comparing these two texts, and you will know in advance the question. OK, in fact, I, I can send that question out to you. The questions out to you today. There are eight questions. You choose one and they're very general. They're, they're about ideas of revenge, attitudes to women, attitudes to family, uh, depiction of relationship between brothers, that kind of thing um, You know, is the sort of thing that will be setting. And we'll be able to go through these texts uh, rather wonderfully. In the case of the homecoming, there's there's a very good a film version uh, in which Pinter had some uh, uh, say. Um, and I can show that to you. I'll be teaching you the homecoming using uh, that visual material. And you'll find that I'll do that with other texts where I can. Uh, I'll do it with The Tempest. Uh, I'll do it with The Duchess of Malfi. Um, uh, uh, what I won't do it with, you may surprise you, is Dracula, because there aren't any very good uh, versions of Dracula. 
so you might that might surprise you uh, what seems the most filmed of gothic novels has not produced one film that i think is a particularly useful to us uh hello i i'm i i'm i would find it difficult to pronounce your name uh uh but I, you're very welcome uh to to the meeting I, I, how would i pronounce your name yeah hi i'm sorry for being late um don't worry it's pronounced like artem uh, artem artem <laughs> yeah it's like a russian name right yeah i know yeah i i taught i taught i taught a student called artem some years ago that's fine brilliant uh, <laughs> uh you'll, you'll forgive me for not being quite sure how to pronounce it okay i can see it now oh yeah you're right artem it is fantastic so artem what i've been describing is simply what we're going to be doing up until october i'm uh, going to be looking at some poems and writing a thousand words on one of those poems then we're going to be writing two thousand words comparing two texts the homecoming by harold pinter in relationship to Jack's Return Home by Ted Lewis. Uh, you can be forgiven if you don't know the Ted Lewis's novel. It's it's rather obscure. And for me, one of the delights of teaching uh, English is introducing students to things that they might not know about in any other way. Um, uh, anyone going on to do English at university will study Harold Pinter, uh, but they might not study Ted Lewis. Uh, Ted Lewis's novel is a wonderful example of what we call noir, noir writing. Um, uh, it develops in America and France uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, it's very tough writing and it depicts a very bleak vision of the human condition. Uh, and of course, actually, you know, written in the 1970s, it perhaps relates to a fascination that developed with existential uh, philosophies from the 1950s onwards. And that, that's the kind of level on which we're going to be talking. Okay. Now, after the uh, October half term, and of course, October half term gives you the most wonderful opportunity to write a first draft of the 2000 word essay comparing Pinter to Lewis. We're going to start looking at The Merchant's Tale uh, by Chaucer, and we're going to compare it to The Duchess of Malfi uh, by John Webster. Uh, John Webster's play was first performed in 1614. Uh, Chaucer's poem dates from the 1390s. Uh, you'll experience, in the case of Chaucer, just a little bit of um, a, uh, a language problem, uh, but that'll go away very, very quickly. And uh, we're going to be comparing these texts in a number of different ways. There's a real stress here on history, on context. Um, and you'll see that I, pro I will provide you with a document that identifies how we can view these texts in a historical way. In second term, uh, excitingly, we're going to be looking at Dracula in relationships to the Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. Angela Carter is a feminist writer. Her work dates from the 1970s and really fits that decade in terms of its uh, attitude to sexual politics. Um, and we're going to be comparing it to Bram Stoker's classic uh, gothic novel, Dracula. And in a moment's time, we're going to be looking at a couple of passages from both those writers. The other exciting thing we do that term is um, we start looking at Gothic as as a whole, uh, because on that exam paper, you have in one case to compare Dracula to Angela Carter's The Bloody Chamber. Fine. But the second half of the paper is devoted to an unseen Gothic passage. And so the more unseens we do, the more you're in a position to understand how Gothic works as a genre. OK, so by the end of term two, you'll have a working knowledge of, of Gothic. You know, you, you, you've look, you'll have looked at Edgar Allan Poe and Radcliffe, uh, you know, for example. You'll know about Matthew Lewis and his shocking novel, The Monk, published in 1796. And of course, the more of those texts that you're familiar with and they might lead you to reading the whole work uh, that you know that that's that's one's hope <laughs> um, uh, the more you're in a position to actually be able to identify uh, the qualities of any unseen gothic passage that is thrown at you the only other thing we do that term is the tempest shakespeare's shortest play i'm often in a position where i can start it just at the end of term one uh, and finish it by February half term. So I'll be teaching that alongside one lesson a week will be devoted to The Tempest, OK, uh, which is a fantastic late play uh, by Shakespeare. Don't let anybody tell you that it's his last play. 
Uh, there's there's a strange theory that it is, it isn't. There's a stranger theory that Shakespeare's bidding farewell to the stage. Well, he isn't doing that because he's got two plays yet to write. So we we can scotch that myth immediately. So but so so uh, any questions about the the text before we actually start to uh, look at a couple of passages taken from those texts? Is it is everyone happy with the text that I'm describing? Everyone all right? OK. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you haven't got down the list, then we, that, that list is available or you can email me. Um, and if you are thinking of taking this course, then I would recommend that you um, set, a, set aside the rest of the summer holiday to read a couple of the novels. Uh, you know, the poems we can deal with in class time, uh, but it's imperative that you've made the acquaintance of Dracula and um, uh, Ted Lewis's uh, Jack's Return Home. Uh, and if you've done that, then you, you've really done yourself uh, some good uh, in relationship to the year course. So what I wanted to do now was uh, just, just show you the kind of level, the kind of things we're interested in at English A-level. And I'm just going to I'm just going to screen share with you. Um, I'm trying to remember how to do this. Uh, uh, I'm just going to screen share with you um, the Dracula, which of course I had to print in red ink uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, did did anybody get a chance to to, to look at the passage? Uh, does anyone have anything to say about this passage um, to start us off? I mean, don't don't, don't be bashful. Um, does anyone was anyone interested in this sequence? Have they have they read it before? Um, it it contains the idea that the vampire is frightened of crucifixes has become a, a staple, hasn't it, of our understanding of vampires, uh, even if we've never read Bram Stoker's novel. But uh, any any contributions will be gratefully received. Anyone want to uh, talk about it or pick out something that interested you? in the passage. What do you think? What do you think? Don't be shy. Can I can I ask you what um is it is it at all fascinating to you that when Jonathan Harker looks in the mirror um he doesn't see the vampire, he sees himself. Is that an idea that we could pursue? Artem, do you, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, well, sir, I'm still reading the passage. Oh, my apologies, my apologies. I thought, I thought some of you might have been sent it. Uh, my apologies if you weren't. Um, yeah, I mean, do, do, um, uh, do, do, do just look at it for a couple of minutes. Um, are, are you looking at it on screen or, or what you sent it, Artem? I'm um, at the screen. OK, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, to look at it and tell me when I need if I need to move the, the screen at all so you can see the rest of it. But yeah, just give yourself a couple of minutes.
anybody have you, have you finished reading that Artem? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um any a, a, anybody want to contribute to discussion about what what is significant, what is striking about this passage? At all. I mean, we can look at it in lots of different ways. We can look at it contextually. We can look at it in terms of when it was written. Uh, we can look at it in terms of its language. Um, any anybody struck by anything in it um, that they'd like to share? What do you think? If if not, or if you're feeling a bit bashful, let let me help you along a bit. Um, it, if I was, to, you know, assuming that I'm teaching you this. Uh, I would be particularly interested in the fact, as I said, that though I think when we see it in the cinema or when we read it just as a novel for pleasure, I think we're obviously struck by the uncanny idea of, of the vampire not having a reflection. Uh, and there's all sorts of reasons associated with folklore why vampires don't apparently create a shadow or create a reflection. Um, apparently, that has to do with the fact that they are they are dead souls. Uh, they are the undead, and they don't have a soul. And in the ancient world, it was thought that your soul actually was um, reflected, as it were, symbolised by your mirror reflection or your shadow. So that that's interesting. I mean, if you like, that's level one. Uh, you know, we got an uncanny effect, haven't we, um, created by the idea that you look into a mirror, you assume that the person who's physically behind you should be reflected in that mirror, and they're not. Okay, fine. But what is more interesting, I think, here is what Jonathan Harker, who's a, who's a solicitor from Exeter, what Jonathan Harker does see. And what Jonathan Harker sees is himself. And when I spoke contextually a moment ago, um, uh, I'd like you to think about when the novel was uh, uh, published. It was published in 1897. It's published in the year, in the age of Freud. It's published in an age where you know Freud and, and other thinkers and writers are particularly interested in, if you like, the primitive self. And the idea that the primitive self doesn't go away. It's there. It's, it's what Freud calls the id. Uh, and for Freud, you probably know there's the superego. The superego is the voice of, you know, what what Christians would call conscience, uh, social obligation, uh, socialization, all those ideas. Uh, but the id is stubborn. Uh, it doesn't go away. And what I'm fascinated by in this passage is the ways in which Jonathan is perhaps confronted by, in looking for the vampire, if you like, he sees himself. And I think that's actually the most profound meaning of Dracula as a novel. And I don't know whether any of you have read it uh, before now, uh, but it's a novel that doesn't other the vampire. I think that I think that's a mistake that people often make when they're thinking about vampires or they're thinking about Bram Stoker's novel. And certainly the cinematic versions, I think, tend to um, identify the vampire as other. Whereas I think the profound thing about Bram Stoker's novel is the ways in which it doesn't other the vampire. It presents the vampire as an aspect of the human self. And so uh, here, um, as elsewhere in the novel, go looking for the vampire and, and, you, and you find yourself. OK, so that, that's the kind of thing we, we might be talking about. And you can see how we're trying to relate it to context, to, to culture. Um, you know, perhaps we could bring in Darwin. I remember Darwin's Origin of the Species was published in, I think it's 1859. Uh, it had the most tremendous impact on Western thinking. Um, it forced people to acknowledge that the human and the animal might be very closely allied okay with one another um a shocking thought uh, for christians particularly for christians who wanted to believe that the uh you know the the, the world was three thousand years old uh and that the first humans looked pretty much like we do okay uh so you know darwin we could discuss in relationship to dracula and the idea of the animal self the animal origins of, of humanity in fact we could see dracula as an embodiment of that okay on the one hand he's an aristocrat you know he's he's a transylvanian count 
Uh, on the other hand, he's presented as being an animal. And, and certainly he's animal here, isn't he? Because as soon as he sees blood uh, issuing uh, from Jonathan, um, he attacks him. He, he can't stop himself. OK, uh, you know, he doesn't <laughs> he doesn't have a, a capacity for socialization such as would tell him that it's really rather um, inappropriate to attack one's guests. What's fascinating here is the crucifix and the idea of it being an external um, item that stops Dracula in his tracks. And, and again, it, it seems to me that maybe Bram Stoker's trying to make a point about the place of Christianity in, in society. Um, remember, Christianity is slowly waning, and you know that Darwin has something to do with that, as I've already hinted. And perhaps Bram Stoker is adopting a rather conservative attitude in this sequence, in which he sees Christianity as the only thing that stands in the way of um, human beings regressing to an animal identity. Okay. Um, and I think the more we look at Dracula, the more we begin to see that Stoker's actually quite confused. And that's that's what makes the novel so interesting to us. Um, it's, it's got a certain conservative quality to it, I think, Dracula. But on the other hand, I think the novel, as I've already suggested, is quite radical. It's a big novel. And I think it suggests, uh, it indicates that, you know, Stoker doesn't quite have an agenda like Angela Carter, as we'll see in a moment. Angela Carter is a feminist. Angela Carter has read lots of feminist discourse for the 1970s. Her, her, her work is clearer to us as to what it's trying to achieve. Whereas I think the exciting thing about Stoker is uh, the, the complexity with which Stoker regards the vampire. Just one last thing to say about this passage, because I, I need to move on. And it's, it's just to point out to you that I find it fascinating as to what Jonathan is actually doing in this sequence. He's shaving. And of course, when we shave, we are actually trying to remove the animal element from our identities. OK, to be clean shaven, if you like, is to try and dissociate ourselves. Um, I mean, don't, don't, don't think for one moment that I think this every time I shave. But the fact is that when we shave, we're trying to distance ourselves from our animal identities. And therefore, I think this passage is particularly remarkable uh, because it features Jonathan trying to maintain, um, you know, civilised values. OK, uh, and on the other hand, we have Dracula operating as a symbol of the it, the instinctual animal self. And I think it's particularly funny how the passage ends. I mean, I, I deliberately ended it where I did uh, because I always find myself amused by the idea that Jonathan is trying so desperately to maintain civilised appearances so that his first thought is, oh, my God, how am I going to shave? You know, I have to find another means by which to shave. OK, and I find that very interesting. Jonathan trying to maintain, uh, you know, the veneer of civilization. Um, uh, in relationship to his experiences at Castle Dracula. Any, 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 any observations from anyone in the light of what I've said? Um, uh, are, are those things you thought of yourself? Is there anything you think I should be stressing uh, that I'm not stressing? Um, I hope you feel that what we did there was we moved very fluidly, I hope, between thinking about the text in its historical context you know thinking about it as a text that comes from the 1890s and couldn't actually i think have come from any other decade uh but notice what we were also doing there we were looking at the language closely uh, and moving between you know language analysis and cultural analysis and that's something that we're going to be doing a lot of uh at english a level all right yeah anything anything yeah, got anyone anything you want to say? No? Are you all right with that? Okay. I even find myself fascinated by the idea that Jonathan is associated with a sticking plaster. The idea of sort of putting something over something else, concealing something. And I I have to admit that how many times I've done this passage and talked about this passage, that only struck me this morning how interesting the sticking plaster is and the ways in which it might symbolize pepper over to deny, you know, what is underneath 
all right so i think one of the great things about teaching is the ways in which one you know one finds oneself coming up with new ideas every every year one teaches i'm going to move on to the companion text which is angela carter's the bloody chamber and the bloody chamber is a series of linked short stories that borrow from fairy tales and rework those fairy tales in a rather interesting uh, feminist way okay so again if i just give those of you who haven't had uh, a chance to read this i just this is the this is the very end of the company of wolves okay which is one of the last stories in the in a collection um could you just look at it just for a moment and then we'll we'll talk about it um i'll i'll move i, I want you to see it all artem if you haven't had access to it in any other way but could i just get you to look at this uh passage from the tail end of the company of wolves and then we'll talk about it Does this feel very different um, in style to the Stoker? Um, you, you might you might bear in mind that it, it contains a similar scenario, doesn't it? Uh, you know, Jonathan Harker, a solicitor from Exeter, is confronted by a vampire. And here, Little Red Riding Hood is confronted by a werewolf. OK, can you can you see a difference in the way that confrontation is handled? What do you think? And do you think that that confrontation, the difference in which that confrontation is handled, might be explained in terms of when Angela Carter's writing in the 1970s? What's she trying to avoid by depicting Little Red Riding Hood in the way that she does? Is that is that something you thought of when you when you read it? What what surprises you about the depiction of Little Red Little Red Riding Hood here? What do you think? Any any comments? Well, let let me help you out. Um, it, it, when you, hopefully you you were read fairy tales too as a child. Uh, I know fashions have changed, but I think people have a working knowledge, don't they? Of you know, Cinderella, Little Red Riding, uh, uh, Little Red Riding Cap, and all the rest of it. 
But isn't it interesting here that, that Angela Carter's story is avoiding the idea of the woman as a victim? Uh, and if you like, those fairy tales, they were written in a patriarchal culture. And they do tend to set up expectations, don't they? Assumptions about, about women. And if you look at the earlier versions of Little Red Riding Hood, uh, Little Red Riding Hood is a figure of naivety uh, who's duped uh, by the wolf. OK, so there's a there's an inbuilt assumption, isn't there, that, you know, men, men are wily, men are cunning, men are intelligent, women aren't very intelligent and women can be duped and, and tricked. OK, and in fact, Charles Perrault, um, who was one of the first writers to anthologize uh, these European uh, folk tales, he actually says that that is the moral uh, of Little Red Cap. Uh, that it's a warning to young women uh, that they mustn't be sweet talked uh, by, um, uh, you know, <laughs> wolves in sheep's clothing, if you like. You know, so so for Perot, the the story is, you know, implicitly sexual. Uh, it's a warning to young women to you know, watch out. OK, now isn't it interesting in this passage that the, the young woman is presented as being interested in a mutual relationship with the werewolf and that's you know that that is deliberately provocative and shocking isn't it to uh, to the reader and um I, the thing i'd highlight i've highlighted there was an attempt to point that out she laughed at him full in the face she ripped off his shirt for him and flung it into the fire in the fiery wake of her own discarded clothing so what we've lost here in a text published towards the tail end of the first full decade of feminism, the 1970s, is the concept of woman as a victim. Uh, and instead, that sentence is implying a mutual desire uh, on the part of Little Red Cap and, and the werewolf. OK, um, and again, notice the, the, the thing that I've highlighted and for me is one of the most important remarks made in the whole of the collection. Um, when um, we, we're all, we're used to this, aren't we? we? We've 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 heard this so often. You know what what big eyes you have, what big teeth you have. We think we know what follows. Uh, and one of the exciting things I think about Angela Carter's strategy is that it's what we call postmodernist. And it's postmodernist because the postmodernist writer tends to work with material that's already um, uh, has currency. You know, people grow up and they were read fairy tales to as children. So the postmodernist writer tends to use material that's already out there, but to rework it, to rethink it. And, and, and this, uh, it's the best definition of postmodernist literature I could give you, uh, because we're so used to the phrase, you know, all the better to eat you with, but we're not so used to the phrase or the idea that the girl burst out laughing she knew she was nobody's meat. And as I say, just as I can't imagine Stoker's novel com uh, coming from any other decade than the 1890s, I can't imagine Angela Carter's collection of stories coming from any decade other than the, the 1970s. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a real mission statement going on here, isn't there, in which women are no longer be, going to be seen as victims, as uh, without any sexual desires of their own, uh, but are actually going to be seen as autonomous, okay, and, and powerful, uh, and the ability on the part of Little Red Cap to laugh, you know, given the fact that she's actually apparently in a fairly disturbing situation, is I think wonderfully conveyed. Notice something else. Uh, look at the word fearful. Look at the ambiguity of the word fearful. Uh, it says she will lay his fearful head on her lap. And she will pick out the lice from his pelt. And the word fearful is deliberately ambiguous, isn't it? Because re read one way, um, it gives us the obvious idea, doesn't it? You know, werewolves are frightening. Uh, but the word is ambiguous, isn't it? And it for a moment conveys the vulnerability of the werewolf. And perhaps the vulnerability of uh, the, the male sex in sexual relationships. So that word fearful is wonderfully judged, isn't it? I mean, again, I... I I think you can see that you know Carter's collection is is much shorter than Stoker's novel, 
and it's probably more deliberate in terms of its you know choices of vocabulary it's, it's very poetical deliberate writing this isn't it and that that's what a short story writer can achieve in a way that a novelist perhaps can't but that word fearful is beautifully judged isn't it because on the one hand it offers us the conventional idea of the werewolf as, as frightening but on the other it offers us the idea of the werewolf's own trepidation uh, if you like uh, there's an implication that this is the first time that there's been a mutual interaction between him and 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 a, a woman uh, and he's presented as being initially troubled by it uh, and that actually means that the little red cap figure is an educational force uh, in the life of the werewolf okay and, that, and that's something that reappears again and again uh, in the bloody chamber stories the idea of women as educative uh, not to be educated but educative in relationship to the men and i think it you know, we can see can't we that angela carter's trying to challenge the ways in which women are uh you know were were understood were constructed in, in a patriarchal culture uh a, a, anything else uh in in the passage that you liked i mean you'll notice i've highlighted the word freely uh, uh every wolf in the world now held a prothalamia and outside the window as she freely gave the kiss she owed him okay that's very important because the, the story doesn't imply that she's being tricked um the story implies that she's as interested in the werewolf as the werewolf is interested in in her okay good uh i i any any comments any 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 other things you wanted to say about uh that text well interesting if we if we were trying to bring them together we might feel that in both cases there's a refusal to see the werewolf or the vampire as other okay i mean I, the, the stoker seems a more conventional piece of writing doesn't it in which you know the exeter solicitor is being threatened by the vampire but but as i said to you there is a kind of radical dimension to stoker's novel in which um uh jonathan harker must confront himself when he goes looking for the vampire and I think certainly in Carter's reworking of the Little Red Cap story, uh, we've got a refusal to other the werewolf. Uh, and we've got a, a sense of the interaction that develops uh, between them. Okay, I mean, the word prophylamian, I don't know if you know what that means. So I've, I've lost it now. Where is it? Prophylamian, that's right. Um, it means a wedding song. Uh, uh, it's an extraordinary word to use. And it suggests that some kind of valid sacred interaction is actually taking place here um you know very very shocking uh to uh, an orthodox reader if you remember the, the the story ends doesn't it by identifying christmas day as the werewolf's birthday um again um gothic writing is not just tra uh, uh dealing with transgression it's actually quite transgressive and i think that's a deliberately shocking provoking proposition to make now i haven't i haven't left a lot of time to to look at uh, uh the tempest and it and it may be that we should use the last four minutes or five minutes to uh you know ju just to get uh, for you to ask any questions that you have uh you've you've been very politely silent uh this session but it, are there any questions that you would now like to ask me about the course or anything that I haven't explained clearly to you. What do you think? Anything to say either about the passages we've looked at or more general considerations about the, the A level course? Well, can I can I just close then on the assumption that um, you know you don't have any questions ask me I think I think I think one one issue that one should think of and maybe you've resolved this in your mind already is why do English and what subjects you should do it with English literature a level remains the gold standard okay there are other English uh, a levels you know English language literature or English language but none of them has the kudos of uh, English literature um, if you are doing other humanity subjects, you know, like history or politics or history of art or, or film studies, for example, then, then English goes incredibly well um, uh, with them. 
OK, um, if, you, if you're doing science subjects, I, I, I know that it's it's less the fashion now for students to do four A levels, um, which is a pity, really, because that fourth A level was often a wonderful way of showing students breadth of knowledge for universities. But, you know, I, I have taught students who are doing science A levels, but are also doing English simply because they want to, um, you know, just uh, develop a breadth of, of knowledge and understanding. Uh, but but I would recommend English to you if you're doing other essay based subjects, uh, you know, particularly history, particularly politics, uh, for example, uh, history of art. Uh, you know, the, the, the English goes brilliantly because it's mutually reinforcing with the other subjects you're doing. OK, you know, you're, you're, you're developing an essay style that is going to work for you in relationship to all the A levels you're doing. Um, and I hope I've stressed enough that the year course works very well. It's not it's not a struggle to complete. Uh, I mean, obviously, I've, I've been doing it for many years, so I, I know how to do it. But I think also one has to stress that the, the students one has are students who have A-level experience. And because they have A-level experience, they're able to um, impress, uh, to get very high grades, OK, because they they have a measure of experience of, uh, of A levels already and they can use the methodology that they developed uh, in relationship to uh, to English. Um, any any other questions that you you want to ask me? As I say, you've been very, very polite, very quiet, uh, but but I, I really would like um, uh, just, just to see that you are happy with what I've said and that everything I've said makes perfect sense to you. Is every, everyone all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, OK, OK, fantastic. Well, well, well as I say, I, I gave you my email and if you like, I'll, I'll repeat my email. Um, it's richard.martin at mpw.ac.uk. You're very welcome to email me any personal questions that you might have. Um, and, and as I say, if you if you want the texts, uh, you know, I'll, ju I'll just send that list out to you. Uh, and as I've said already, if you if you do want to do this in September, then start reading the novels. You know, look, look at Jack's Return Home, look at look at Dracula, and then then you've really made progress in advance of the course. And I can also send out to you the the coursework questions, uh, because if you've got those, if you've got the questions in advance of actually even reading the novels, uh, then you're in a very strong position. Okay, so I'm I'm very much hoping to. Uh, to, to to meet with you all uh, in class uh, in September. Uh, so uh, it only remains for me to uh, uh, wish you uh, a happy conclusion to your summer holidays. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in September. Is that all right, Jason? Are you happy to end it there? Absolutely, yes. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, okay, uh, that's great. Okay, all the best. All the best now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, see you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.